It's good to be home. So glad. So appreciate the uh, last two weeks. Pastor Ham and the great word that he spoke. What a powerful word on the greatest story. And of course, Pastor Rob last week and encouraging us with first fruits and uh, the, the many stories in the Bible that talk about first fruits. I thought it was a powerful message. And of course, three weeks ago, Pastor Darla preached the first message on first roots. If you haven't heard any of those, I encourage you to go hear those and how it's important. You know, for me, I, I want to be a lifelong student. I want to continue to learn about the word. There's things in the word I still don't know. There's things in 30 years I'll be learning for the first time. And so I want to continue. I've never exhausted the word where I say I know everything. There's so much more to learn and so much more to know. And uh, so as we begin this morning, I want you to turn over to uh, the book of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. And I want to title this Four Reasons to Give, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, as you heard with Pastor Darrell and Pastor Rob, the definition that we use for First Roots is it's a seed we plant in faith and worship and honor to God for all he's done for us and all he'll do for us this year. And so we honor the Lord. Giving is a way we honor God. Prayer, we honor God. Fasting, we honor God. Worship, we honor God. Our lifestyle is an honor to God. And just before the Palm Sunday, as it were, the entry into Jerusalem... This book of John, chapter 12, is where we're coming out of John 11, where Jesus had just healed Lazarus, just raised him from the dead. And it was a, not only a tremendous miracle, but it was one of his first public miracles that was significant. And it had begun to shift some things in Jesus' ministry. As you know, Mary and Martha... We're the brother, we're the sisters of, John, of Lazarus. And so they were ecstatic. But let me read this passage in John 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover celebration began, John, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, of course she did. And Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Let me stop there. I want to make some observations first in this passage that I think are important for us to see. As I said, Mary and Martha were there they were celebrating the brother. There was a house full of disciples. Even some religious leaders had come to talk to Jesus and see Lazarus. And in the midst of all this, Mary decided to give something to Jesus that was worth a year's wages. It was a significant gift. Mary wanted, first of all, to make her love known to Jesus. Mary loved Jesus. Mary didn't care what anyone else thought. Mary didn't care whether it was the right time or wrong time. For her, she loved Jesus. And she wanted to give something to Jesus that was significant. Secondly, Mary was honoring Jesus for raising her brother. She recognized what Jesus had done for her. And she wanted to honor Jesus. She wanted to show him great honor and gratefulness for what he had done. Thirdly, 
Mary's gift, as I said, was worth a year's wages. She was saying, I am committed to you. I'm not giving you a tip. I'm giving you something significant. And she was willing to give everything. Fourth, Mary's gift created a fragrance that filled the room. Mary's gift created a fragrance that filled the room. When we give, I want to pull this out for a minute because I'm going to jump into more. I'm just laying foundation. We can give, but some gifts create a different fragrance than others. Let me give you an example. If you receive a ring asking to be married, that gift of a ring creates a fragrance in the moment. When you get engaged, when you receive a spouse, a husband or wife, that gift. Let me rephrase that. You receive a spouse in Christ and a gift creates a fragrance in the room. When you receive a significant gift like a child, it creates a fragrance. There's a joy that fills the room. There's an excitement. There's a fragrance. It's not like walking up to somebody and giving them a, a $1.50 Kit Kat bar. I can give you a Kit Kat bar, which you may say thank you for, but I'm not creating a fragrance. I'm not creating an atmosphere. But if I walked up to you and I handed you keys to a brand new car that's paid for, it would create a fragrance in the room. It would create a, a great a gratitude and appreciation. There's a fragrance that comes with giving. And we have to take note of that. I want my giving to God to create a fragrance for him. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care if everybody else likes it or everybody else hates it. It doesn't matter. Does he like it? Does he love it? Is that what he wants? Am I creating a fragrance with my giving? Or am I just giving what I want and it doesn't mean anything to me, so it won't mean anything to him? The word says that if it doesn't mean something to you, it won't mean anything to him. It's got to mean something for us to give it. So fifthly, Jesus loved Mary's gift. Jesus loved it. Jesus could have stopped her. He could have said, no, Mary. No, 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 no. This is all wrong. Just get me a, a bucket of water. Wash my feet. It's, it's too expensive. It's too much. Jesus loved the gift. He received it with deep affection. Jesus noticed the gift. Jesus notices what we give. I want you to understand that. Even you look in the scriptures, Jesus would stand by the offering buckets. He noticed when the woman who gave her last two coins and said she's given more than y'all. Because it wasn't the amount as much as it was the amount to her. What it was costing her. It was a full submission. It was a full surrender. Two coins to most people isn't much. But to this widow woman who had nothing, it was everything. And Jesus notices. It doesn't matter if somebody else thinks what you give is great or small. But Jesus notices. Sixthly, not everyone else will appreciate your gift. Not everyone, will appreci not everyone appreciated Mary's gift. Look at the disciples. They didn't appreciate it. Look at some of those around. Judas didn't appreciate it. They didn't understand. Some were jealous. Some were upset. Some were outraged. And when I thought about this, I think the reason some get upset is like, well, Jesus doesn't need it. Why does he need special oil for his feet? Jesus has everything. He can command the angels of God to bring him anything he wants. Why would Jesus need a year's worth of wages poured on his feet. They were upset at Jesus for not stopping her. 
And then what was really offensive in this passage was they tried to blame the poor as an excuse. And they used the poor as an excuse for their outrage. Well, you know, the poor really could have used it. The poor can use it. And it's okay. Give money to the poor. We give money to the poor. I don't like taking money from widows. I don't like taking money from the poor. I don't want to take it. either. I get it. I understand. We give. And so people don't mind if you give to build a new hospital or a new college or a new university, even though they're teaching antichrist things. They don't mind if you give millions or you give thousands to those things. But if you give it to God, it's too much. They're outraged. And Jesus, in his wisdom, looked at him and said, give to the poor whenever you want. They're always going to be here. Jesus did not allow them to shame him. And Mary did not allow them to shame her. Don't allow anybody to shame you and you're giving. You give how much? How much do you give to God? You gave all of that? What about your future? What about this? And people will try to shame you in what you give. Here's what I do know. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God says he loves a cheerful giver. He loves it when we give. God loves it when we give to him. Giving has much, much significance, much more than we realize. As I was processing this message and praying, I was brought back to something Pastor Rob said last week in his message. And he's, he was talking about the widow in 1 Kings 17 who had literally nothing. She was getting ready to eat her last meal and feed it to her son and then die. And God spoke to her. And he said in verse 9, he says, I have commanded the widow there to provide for you. I promise you, we do not understand God. Why didn't God go to a rich person and say, give Elijah a meal? You got loaded in your pantry. You got tons of food in your pantry. Why don't you give something? But he went to the way. Why God does what God does is up to God. Why God asks you for something is up to God. Why God wants you and I to give is between us and God. You and God need to have that conversation. I'm sure the widow was thinking, what do you mean you want me to give a meal to the prophet? Which in those days, which it still is in those days, it was like giving it to God. And it was giving it to God and God knew it was giving it to him. How, how am I going to give him something when I, I have one meal left? And this isn't a message about asking the poor for money because my flesh that bothers me. And as I, as I listened to his message, something in my flesh says, I don't like that. I don't like that God did that. I, I, I know God did it, but I felt bad. I felt bad for the widow. I don't want to take anything from them. But the problem is, when you think like that, that means you've got to have a better relationship with God. Isaiah 55, 9 said, for my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I can tell you the problem that I have sometimes. The problem that I have, that I believe some of us have, is I don't think like God enough. I don't think the way God thinks. My flesh can get in the way. My mind can get in the way. My plans. Well, you know, I got this plan for my money. I got this plan for my children, for my retirement. I got this plan. And so I can get in the way of thinking, well, you know, I can only do this. Because I don't think like God. And I have to continue, the Bible says, to renew our minds. That we think like God. How many want to think like God more? When you say that, what you're saying is, I'm open to God saying things that will challenge me. Because your flesh will not want to do everything God wants to do. God may have told some of us to fast this year. And some of us are like, well, I want to, but my flesh says no. And maybe you started, maybe you struggled. And we can struggle. We can struggle in different areas of our life with God. 
It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad Christian. You just got to understand God's ways are higher than my ways. And for us to say things like, well, God would never ask a poor person to do that. You don't know the word of God. You do not know the word of God. Like I said, my flesh grinds against it. But because I know the ways of God and I continue to know the ways of God, I understand that he does things for reasons that I'll never understand. I thought about it and I thought about my what if I did that to my son? My son's in college and uh, he doesn't have any real money. He's got a few dollars here and there. He don't he don't mind me talking about it. The other kids don't like it, but he doesn't mind. So he's, he's got college money. We all know what college money is. Right. You got ramen. And so you got college money. But he's got a few dollars he saved up and but not a lot. And I thought. I thought I'm just putting all your business out there. I know. I'm sorry, son. It's a good example. Trust me. And so what if I went to him out of everybody I know, I picked him out and I said, son, I want you to give me everything you've got. Some people would say, that's not fair. You got paychecks. You've got all that you've got income here. Why are you asking to clear out? Son, I want you to give me all your savings. I want you to give me all your checking. I want you to give me everything. And I don't say anything more. I just asked him for that. That would offend some people. But maybe I'm asking for different reasons. What if one of the reasons I was asking was, like God asked us, is he submitted to me? Does he trust me? Without me telling him. What if I'm asking to see his response because I know he doesn't know what I'm getting ready to do for him. He doesn't know. I'm testing him. Because I'm getting ready to do something for him that he may need or I may give him something that he just wants. Something to bless him. But I'm not telling him all that. Because I know the word. I know the scriptures. And I understand in the scriptures, Luke 6.38 says, Give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. I know that scripture, Luke 6.38. I know Galatians 6, 7 that says, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. So I know the principles of sowing and reaping. If I plant something, I'm going to reap something. And I've taught that to my kids. I also know 2 Corinthians 9, 6. It says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. I know the word of God. But I also know James 4, 3. James 4, 3 says, even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. And you want what you want for your pleasure. So I understand the balance of sowing. I also understand the balance of giving when it's just something I want. And if my son said to me, Dad, I'll give it to you if you give me a new car or you pay off all my schooling. Now, anybody would make that trade. But that would be a wrong mindset. If I had to agree, all right, son, you give me what's in your accounts, which I know what's in his accounts. <laughs> and I'll get you a new car or I'll pay off all your schooling. That would not require any faith from him. That's just a good deal. Everybody would take that deal. And I think sometimes we do that with God. We think if I give God a hundred dollars, he'll bless me with a thousand or ten thousand. Some of us maybe even heard some of that teaching. And that's a wrong mindset. God will bless me however God wants to bless me. Maybe if I give to God, he'll fix something that needs fixing. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But if that's the only reason I'm giving to God, 
I need to be careful of my motives. Maybe I'll give to God and he'll buy me a miracle or buy me a blessing. The problem when you do that is it can set you up for disappointment because you haven't done it in faith. And so I want to talk about four reasons to give. I encourage you to write these four down. Reason number one. Sometimes we give just because we love him and are grateful for everything he's done for us. Sometimes in my giving, I just give to God because he's so good. He's such a good father. I can see Mary pouring out that oil upon Jesus' feet. Thank you. I love you so much. What's a year's wages? I love you so much. Everything you've done. If it wasn't for you, Jesus, I wouldn't be sober. If it wasn't for you, Jesus, I wouldn't be alive. If it wasn't for you, Jesus, I'd be dead. I'd be strung out. I'd be have lost my family, lost my wife, lost my children. If it wasn't for you, Jesus, I would have been fired from my job. If it wasn't for you, Jesus, sometimes you give just because you love him. And he's always been there. He's taken care of you even when you haven't been as faithful as you should have. He's provided at times when we didn't deserve it. His mercy and his grace on our lives. Sometimes you give to God just because I love you. And I thank you. We're coming into Easter just because of Jesus. Just because you gave me Christ. I love you so much. I honor you so much. I thank you so much. You're such a good father. Just because. Second reason. Sometimes we give because we are totally surrendered to him and we put our complete trust in him. Sometimes we give because we're totally surrendered. Jesus, I am surrendered to you. This money means nothing to me. I am surrendered to you, to your plans for my life to your desires for my money. I don't care if you want to wipe out everything I've got. I am surrendered. Think about that for a minute. If you, especially if you have a lot. What if God asked you for everything? Are you that surrendered? Are you that surrendered where if God asked for everything, am I that surrendered? I want everything in your accounts. Your 401k. Your retirement, your stocks, your bond, everything you've got saved, I want it all. Am I that surrendered? And do I trust him that much? That I'll give him anything he wants. Reason number three. Sometimes we give because he's asked us to give. Sometimes we give just because he asked. I want that. What do you mean you want? The, I want your tithe. We see that in the word. He wants our tithe. I give because that's what he wants. We see Jesus right as he's coming, before he comes in Jerusalem, he says to the, the disciples, go get me a donkey that's never been written on and tell them to give it to you. Now, the guy giving it could have felt some kind of way giving it. You're not even paying me for it. And he says, I don't want one of your raggedy donkeys. I want one of the ones that are new, that have never been sat on. I want that kind of donkey. I don't care. You can see other donkeys around me. I'm looking for a specific one. I want that. And I want it as a gift. Sometimes God will just ask you for that. Say, I want that. And then fourthly, sometimes we give because we need a miracle. And we want to plant a seed in faith. Sometimes we give because we need a miracle. And we want to plant a seed in faith. When I talk about seed, to me the word seed is a very wide word. If you're not putting time into prayer, 
Prayer is a seed. Fasting is a seed. Intercession is a seed. Um, serving is a seed. Witnessing is a seed. Watering that seed. If I'm not putting in the time, there's got to be a balance to the seed. Some people will plant a seed, but then they don't live their life the right way. If I'm going to plant a seed, I want to plant my life as the seed along with the finances. I'm, sometimes God's asked me for something. Give me a seed and I'll provide. You've heard us tell testimonies about our house and about the birth of our children and how we planted seeds for that. And even if God didn't give us a house and even if God didn't give us our children, I would still trust God. Because there's times when I planted seed where I've seen God do a miracle. There's times when I planted seed where that miracle's taken years. There's times when I planted seeds and I've never seen it come to pass. I, at the end of the day, have to trust God. Because sometimes the seed I'm planting is not for the right thing that I need. And God knows what I need. And God knows what I'm supposed to have. Yes, yeah, some things I do need to plant a seed for. Some things I don't need. I just want. And sometimes we plant in error because, like, well, I want a million-dollar house. Nothing wrong with a million-dollar house. Nothing wrong with it. But does God want you to have a million-dollar house? Nothing wrong with a $50,000 house or a $100,000 house or a $10 million house. I have passed no judgments. What does God want for me? What job does God want me to have? Where does he want me to work? What is his plan? Because sometimes we plant seeds for things God doesn't want. And so I have to hear, if I'm planting a seed, I have to know it's from God. What am I planting a seed for? Because otherwise I'll set my faith wrong. And my faith will be in what I want rather than in Jesus. Because at the end of the day, what I really need and what I really want is more of him. I may need a miracle in the natural, but what I really need is him. I need more. I need to go deeper in him. And I have to ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? When I'm believing God for a miracle... The reason I pray and the reason I give is so that I can hear God. Let me say it again. The reason I give is so I can hear God. I need to hear God's direction. I've sowed seed for my destiny before. God, what do you want me to do with my life? I need to hear your voice. I didn't sow seed to become a pastor. I didn't want to become a pastor. I didn't sow seed to become a doctor. You wouldn't want me to operate on you. (laughs) Or a lawyer or anything else. I sow a seed because I need to know, God, I need to hear from you. And it creates a fragrance. And it creates an opportunity for me to hear God's voice. Sometimes we plant a seed. Well, I'm just believing God for healing. Well, I want to encourage you, plant a seed for hearing more than healing. Because if you can hear, you'll be able to get to your healing. I'd rather have the ability. It's like teaching. Do I give the man a fish or do I teach him how to fish? I'd rather teach you how to fish. I'd rather teach you how to hear than just see you be healed one time. And so you have to learn. And sometimes we go through things because God wants to teach us how to hear, how to receive. Because I'd rather be in the will of God than doing what I want to do. Five questions to ask. Five questions. Question number one. Do I really love God more than anything? More than money? More than family? Matthew 6, 24 says, I can't love God and money. So if you're one of those that goes around and says, I love money. Matthew 6, 24 says, you can't love money and love God. They work apart from each other. So you're in trouble. You won't know God the way you think you should know God because money, you have a love for money. Money's a means. 
Money's a means for transactions, whatever God wants to do. Money is not my goal. I don't care if I have a ton of money or I have no money. I want money, but I want money to do what God wants me to do. I don't want God to ask me to do something and I can't pay for it. So that's why I want it, because he may want me to give. He may want me to help somebody. He may want me to do it. Second question. How often do I tell God or show God how much I appreciate him? How often do I tell God or show God? Does the fragrance of my love and appreciation fill the room? When I give to God, I can feel his presence. He knows I love him and I know he loves me. Number three, question. How often do I give because he's asked me to give? How often do I give because he's asked me? Because we know he asked for the tithe. He says the tithe is holy. It already belongs to me. And we know he'll ask for offerings. We see him do that throughout the word. Here's the challenge. Some people say to me, well, I didn't hear God tell me anything. And I'll always say to them, did you ask? You know, you know, kids are smart. I didn't hear you call me, mom. Well, your stereo is up to 100. The door was closed. And you had headphones on. You know, sometimes we don't hear because we don't want to ask. Because if we ask, God may tell us. I don't want to ask God about tithing because he may tell me to tithe and I love money too much. I don't want to ask God about offering. I don't want to ask God about giving because if I ask him, he may tell me to give and I don't want to give. Or or even better yet, I'll just give God what I think he should get. Or what I can afford. And it's a very dangerous place To put ourselves thinking that we know what God is thinking. Question number four. Am I willing to plant seeds of faith for my miracle? Like I said before, seeds include prayer, fasting, intercession, serving, giving. Do I continue to water those seeds in prayer? Some of us, we really do need a miracle. And we need to plant seeds. I know the scriptures on sowing and reaping. I know they're true. I know that God will bless you. I know God will pour in. Again, he will give you what he wants to give you. Question number five. Are we selective givers or surrendered givers? Am I a selective giver or am I a surrendered giver? God, whatever you want. God, whatever you want. I think if we're honest, and if I'm honest standing here, there's parts of our lives that we're a selective Christian. We're not a surrendered Christian in some of those areas. For some of us, maybe that's prayer. Maybe you pray, but you're not really surrendered. There is a difference between praying for a minute and praying for an hour. There's a difference. We can be selective prayers. Some of us are selective worshipers. We don't like to worship or praise. We're selective. Some of us, we worship everywhere. We worship at home. We worship in the car. We worship in the church. We worship. Some of us, we're just selective. We just worship if we feel like it. We're selective worshipers. We're selective with fasting. We're selective fasters. Even if God asks, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Some of us are selective with tithing. Well, I tithed this week, but I didn't tithe last week. We're selective with serving. I don't know if I really want to serve. I don't know if I really want to do that. I, I, did you even ask God, do you want me to serve? Do you want me to get involved? I've already done all the serving. I don't need to serve anymore. Some of us are selective in our lifestyle, being pure, being holy. Pure in actions, pure in thoughts. Some of us are selective in how we treat people. We're sweet and kind in church. (laughs) 
Let me ask your children how you really are at home. Let me ask your spouse how sweet and kind. The persons you should be the sweetest and the kindest to are right in your house. Are you submitted to being sweet and kind, gentle, long-suffering, patient, all those great fruits that we all enjoy to eat? Are we submitted or are we selective? When anybody says, if I was God, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't ask for that. I would have stopped that. That's pride. It's a very dangerous thing for you to think and for me to think, if I was God. If those words ever come across your mind, cast them out immediately. You're full of pride. But we saw that with Jesus. The religious leaders, as we're coming into Palm Sunday, the religious leaders thought God was wrong when, Je when he picked Jesus as the Messiah. Some still do. They don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. They thought God was wrong. God would never pick a child from Nazareth. Nazareth, the ghetto. God isn't going to pick somebody from the ghetto. I'm just telling you what they thought about where Jesus was born. That was a big deal. Who his mother and father were. God, if I was God, I wouldn't have picked Mary and Joseph. If I was God, Jesus would have been born into a royal family. A rich family of, family of kings and queens. He's royalty. That's why you're not God. That's why the religious leaders were wrong. They couldn't accept the Messiah because they had all these things if I was God. And so they couldn't accept the Messiah because he didn't look like what they hoped he would be. They didn't look like... So when you're not looking for God, but you're looking for your image of God, you're going to make mistakes. I'd rather look for God and be wrong than have an image of God that's wrong and be deceived by having the wrong image and miss the blessing God's got for me. They totally missed all these religious leaders. The smartest guys in the room were the dumbest guys. Their education didn't make them any smarter. We can be deceived by our education. We can be deceived by our experiences. We can be deceived by our intellect. We can be deceived very easily because we think God should do it this way or that way or God would never ask for this or that. Really? Go talk to Abraham about asking for his son. If you don't think God will ask for that, that's probably the exact thing God wants. If it's something you're not willing to give, don't be surprised if God asks for it. Because it's an idol to you. And God will have no other gods before me. God may ask for your house. I love this house. I built this house. This is my favorite house. I want you to sell your house. I want you to downsize. And I want you to give the rest to me. I want your job. I want you to launch out on your own. Or I want you to do this. Whatever God asks for. Do I trust God? I'm not saying it's easy. Some pastors are afraid to preach like this. And the reason they're afraid, it's genuine. They don't want to feel responsible if God doesn't come through. I don't feel responsible. That's why I'm not afraid to preach like this. 
I don't feel responsible. This is between you and him. It's not between me and you. I'm not asking you for anything and I'm not promising you anything. That's between you and the Lord. But we think we've got to defend. I don't have to defend God for asking. If God wants that, then God can have that. But your beef is not with me. It's with the Lord. And you need to discuss with God. What are you asking for? If you're trying to manipulate God, it won't work. I don't know if you realize this, but I pray all the time for you. I pray for the blessing of God upon every person in this congregation. I pray for increase and bonuses and checks in the mail for you all the time. I pray that God will bless you exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think all the time. Well, pastor, why do you do that? Because if God blesses you exceedingly abundantly above, you can do exceedingly abundantly above. And you'll have the resources to do exceedingly abundantly above. So when God asks you for something, you'll have the ability to do something because God's blessed you to do something. I pray and ask God to give you wisdom on what to buy, what not to buy, what to spend on, what not to spend on. Sometimes we buy things we, God doesn't want us to buy and we don't buy things God does want us to buy. And I pray all the time that God would bless you so much that you'll have enough. But here's the thing. For me to have enough means I've got to stay in his will. And that means there's times God may want me to quit something and do something else. There's times God may, I may want to launch out on my own and God says, stay in your job. Well, I'm ready. I don't want to be anybody else's. I don't want anybody to boss me around. Well, God may be saying, you need a boss. Stay there. It's nothing wrong with that. I have a boss. We're all accountable to someone. And so I understand that. But we get weird thoughts like I'd never do that because of this. Well, what if God asked you to? Well, this is what I've always dreamed. But did he dream it? Just because it's your dream doesn't make it his dream. And again, hearing, I've got to hear the will of God. But I'm praying that God blesses this congregation so much that none of us will lack. This congregation will never lack. This church will never lack. Whether we put in a parking lot, whether we put in new pews or a new stage or new whatever, we'll have no lack. I pray that all the time for you, that the blessings of God are upon you. Wherever we need to go, whatever we need to do. Lastly, and as I close, I was thinking about this over the last couple of weeks. And my wife and I were talking about it a little bit. I don't know what kind of inheritance financially I'm going to leave my children. I know the word of God says, leave an inheritance to your children's children. But they're not born yet. And so I don't know <laughs> what kind of inheritance I'm leaving to my children or my children's children. I don't know what kind of financial inheritance. I don't know if they'll have much. If my wife and I passed away today, they, sorry, you don't have much. <laughs> we just spent it on a wedding and on a, uh, a little chip. It's all gone. Sell the house. Take what you can get. <laughs> I don't know if I'll leave them financial inheritance. And let me be very honest. I'm raised them in such a way that it won't matter to them. They'll have more than enough. But I do know the inheritance I want to leave them is the inheritance of knowing God, of loving God, an inheritance of knowing how to pray, of knowing how to fast. Of, of how to walk by faith and not by sight. The inheritance of serving the Lord. The inheritance of having the word of God and hearing from God. That's the inheritance I want to leave my kids. I do want to leave them an inheritance. Whether it's financial or not, it doesn't matter to me. But for me, the spiritual outweighs the financial by a million. I want them to serve the Lord 
What good is it if they gain the whole world, but they don't know Jesus? I give them a million dollars, but they're far from Christ. What good is that? And so thinking about my giving, God, what do you want? What do you want to do in me? What are you asking from me? I want to give because I love God. I want to give because I'm completely surrendered to God. I want to give because he asks me to give. Nothing wrong with him asking. He asks all through the word of God. Sometimes asking is a test. I want to give because I may need a miracle. I may need a healing. And God's asking me to plant a seed for that. I don't know. Every year when we come around this time, my wife and I, we've done this now for probably close to 30 years. And we've seen the blessings of God in our lives over and over and over and over again. And there's been some tough years. There's been some difficult years. But that scripture really does hold true for us. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed his seed, his seed begging bread. If there's no seed, there might be some begging. And so I have to realize that everything I am is because of God. Everything I have is because he loves me and I love him. So when we come into days, days like this, I'm, I'm just like, Lord, what do you want? What do you want me to give? As we're coming into Easter time, I'm reminded of the love of Jesus for me. And it always reminds me, Jesus, I love you so much. I could never repay you. But what gift is going to produce that fragrance in you today? That fragrance that you'll say, I know you love me. I know you trust me. What do you want me to give you that's significant? What do you want me to give you that means something to you? So I want us to do something this morning. I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll help me. There's little first fruits cards that the ushers can pass out. Some of you may have received it last week and you brought it back this week. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't get one last week and you want one this week or maybe you forgot yours and you want one. I'm just going to ask them to walk down the aisles. If you want one, just lift your hand and they'll give you one. A little first fruit card. Well, pastor, what are you doing with these? Well, good question. I'll tell you what I'm doing. them. These are actually for you, not for me. I'm not taking them. So when you come up to the front at the end, if you come up to the front, we're going to pray over these, but you take them back with you. The only thing you leave today is if you feel to give an offering today out of this, then leave your offering. But what I do with this is two things. I look at the front of it and it says, what am I believing for? So I asked the Lord, is there something you want me to believe for? I already know, my wife and I, what, we, what I'm believing for this year. I know what I'm asking God for. I know what I'm setting my faith for. I believe I know what God's asking me to believe for. And if you don't know, we're going to take a few minutes and pray, and I'm going to ask God to speak to each one of our hearts. And on the back, it says, my commitment is whatever that number is. Could be hundreds, could be thousands, it could be whatever. Whatever that number is that God puts in your heart, that's the commitment that I'm going to bring to God over the next four weeks. Over the next four weeks. Maybe you have it today, maybe you have part today, you're going to bring it. By the end of April, you're going to give for a first fruit offering, for a seed offering, an offering in faith, an offering in love. What am I believing? What's my commitment? And I encourage you, ask the Lord for both sides. Lord, what do you want me to believe for? And Lord, what do you want me to give? Don't be afraid to let God speak to your heart. You say, well, pastor, I don't feel to be a part of this. You don't have to be. In fact, if you're new here, you really don't have to be. But even if you've been here forever, you don't have to be a part of this. It's if God speaks to you and you feel to be a part of it. There's nothing in me that will ever want to force anybody to give anything. Just like I don't force people to get saved. I don't force people to serve. I don't force people to, I, I don't want to ever do that. But this is between you and the Lord. This is something you and the Lord need to discuss. 
If you're with your spouse, this is something you and your spouse could talk about. Are you feeling anything? Now, if you write what you're believing for, you can write whatever you want. But at the end of service, what I'll ask you to do is come up and we want to pray with you. Please don't tell me 12 things to pray for you're believing for. I'll, I'll agree with you for one or two. And then I'll put my hand on for the rest and say, Lord, and whatever else you got there. Because I'm not going to read the whole list. I'm not going to look at the other side. I'm not looking at what you're giving. It doesn't matter to me. I don't take these and add them up. I don't do any of that. This is between you and the Lord. What do you think God wants you to do? Just take a minute and I want you to pray. Pray as a couple. Is God, is there anything you want me to do? Is there anything I'm believing for this year? If you are going to give something, there should be envelopes in the back of your pews. You can give that way. You can just put it under first fruits. Or you can give uh, through your app, through the text to give. You can give that way as well. Um, online, you can give that way. Giving's important. I understand some pastors don't think giving's important. I think giving is one of the most important spiritual principles. If you're not a good giver, that's not a good thing. Giving's important. Prayer's important. Worship's important. Reading your word's important. Sharing the gospel's important. Living for Christ's important. It's all important. Jesus said, when you pray, when you fast, when you give. Giving's important. Both in the Old and New Testament, it talks about tithes and offerings. And so it's important. It's a principle. The enemy may have harassed you. You need to beat him back and say, I'm not losing to you any longer. Take a minute and pray. have the ushers bring some buckets up maybe about six or eight just a couple on the seats and a couple over here there is no pressure to give just put a couple in the middle if you can just give me two right there take another one down here sister Jessie You know what I can say, and I say this very proudly, and I say this with a right spirit. Our congregation, we're, we have a lot of really good givers. Our congregation is blessed. I look at the jobs that many people have, we're blessed. I look at the giving that we get as, get as a whole every week, we're a blessed congregation. And so I want you to understand that many of us We've endeavored to live this for many years. That our hearts, that we would be good givers. And so you're stepping into a congregation that knows how to give and knows how to sow and knows how to reap. We've seen the blessing of God over and over again in our life. But please, please, please do not feel, and I mean this with all my heart, any pressure. I am not going to look at who gives what. I am not. None of that's in my heart. I want you to be blessed. Before I pray for the offering, I want to just, just bow your heads with me. Is there anybody here you don't know Jesus Christ and you want to give your life to Christ this morning and you want to surrender yourself to Christ? You're not really surrendered to God, but today's the day you say, I want to really give my life to Christ. I want to serve him with all my heart. If that's you, will you put your hand up really high so I can see it? Say, I want to give my life to you in the balcony, or you're on the floor. 
I just want to give you an opportunity. I don't know if there's somebody here that just doesn't know Jesus. But you really want to give your life to Christ. If that is you at the end of service, when the pastors come down front, they're coming down front in a minute. When they come down front, just come to one of us and say, I'm giving my life to Christ. And we will pray with you and believe God with you. Now, Father, I ask that you would touch this congregation. I ask, Father, that you would speak to them, Lord, what they need to hear. Father, I rebuke all negative thoughts. I rebuke every lie of the enemy. And, Father, I ask that the preciousness of your spirit would be honored today. That, Father, even as this message has come forth, Lord, I just ask that your spirit would lead and guide us. And Father, whatever you want to do in us this year, whatever you want to do in us individually, whatever you want to do in our homes, whatever you want to do in our church, in our city, Father, we want to be used by you. And we just ask, Lord, that you would use us. Speak to us. Let us really hear your voice and trust you. You are a good Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching this video. We pray that it encouraged and blessed you. We invite you to check out more of our content. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'll see you soon.